Moving along here now, we let's look at old and new. And so really the church is the, the church of Messiah. And so you see the merging of two here and the promise of the kingdom. You are not far from the kingdom of God really defines that the mosaic and, and this is coming back to the command of love God and love others. So the command, the fundamental command is love God, love others. And the rub is the kingdom of God. And so we would want to equate kingdom of priests with this. Okay, and, and we're going to further unpack this. We're going to further unpack this big time when we look at the next section here. So what we've essentially done is we've unpacked the command and the command is contained in here. And, and then we've, we've, we've looked at that in the second law. And then we've looked at it in Jesus, the Messiah. And so really this promise is really going to come back to the promise here of being a treasured possession. So I hope you're really seeing that there, there is shadow aspects to the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, and then there's permanent substance that we are we are benefactors to. So let's let's go back to our study. Let me bring back up my Hebrew text. Now let's go ahead and let us look at the promise. So now we're gonna focus on the promise. And so the first promise that we see here is we are going to be you will be a treasured possession, a treasured possession. So this accents the Lordship of God. This is given to, to Israel. And this is because God is possessor or owner of, of all things. So then we want to ask the question, what about us? How does this relate to us? And so actually, I searched, I searched this word in in the Greek Septuagint. So let's let's do a quick study here. So I'm going to bring up the Greek Septuagint here. So I'll add a parallel of ESV. And so let's go to Exodus. 19.4. So now we're looking at, at the Greek here. And so looking at the Greek, there's a reference to the, to the covenant, you will be my people. And then it's the, the Greek word, which is the, the translation for the Hebrew word, periousias, periousias. Okay. So I can look up this word. I'm going to look this word up in I'm going to search this in the Greek Bible, Old and New Testament. Okay, so there's several times when it's used. If you know Greek, you can look it up on, you can look it to the left. So the first time it's used is my treasured possession. It, that's the text that we're using here. The next time is Exodus 23, 22. Be careful to obey my voice in Exodus 23, 22. I don't know why. It's, okay, so maybe this is added in the in the Septuagint that we're missing in the, in the in the in the ESV, but here it's you will be my my treasured people above all the nations. So this is a restatement from Exodus 19:5. For to me are all is all the earth. For to me is all the earth. So again, there's this is literally a restatement of this promise here that you will be a special people because the because the whole earth is mine. Deuteronomy 7, 6, you are a people holy to the Lord. The Lord has, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. So again, a restatement there. Treasured possession, Deuteronomy 14. So this is fundamental to the Mosaic Old Covenant, okay? Now, this is where it gets crazy. So you have, uh, this word is used multiple times referring to Israel as God's treasured people. And in fairness, we, we would never say the Septuagint is inspired. But it is helpful. It is helpful for us to understand connections. And there are times where the New Testament quotes it. 
And so I do think this is a time where the New Testament quotes this word. So Paul is talking about our redemption and salvation in Titus 2.14, describing the work of Jesus Christ, the God and our, our God, our great God and Savior, who gave himself to redeem us from lawlessness, from the law, to purify himself a people. So literally, a people for his possession. Laon, la, laon. Periusian, laan periusian, literally the same word here. So he's quoting not just periusias, but a people of his possession, his treasured possession. So this is a two word quotation in just, um, it's the same word. It's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different place in the sentence. In, in the one, it's a predicate nominative. In this case, it is a uh, looks like uh, it's a direct object, um, people of his, um, yeah, people of his own possession. So, so strong. So here we have, this is applied to Israel. And now we see in Titus 2.14, fulfillment in church. So do we say that God has two different special people, Israel and the church? Or do we see that Titus 2.14 is fulfilling the fundamental eternal aspect that the Mosaic Covenant pointed to, being fulfilled in Christ and then applied to his people, applying, applying to Jesus Christ as, as it pertains to his human nature and to his body, head and body. And I would say that this has to be a reference to the fulfillment of the church. And so this passage is a promise that is now being fulfilled in the church, and, and we are the recipients of that. So incredible and so powerful. And so here we're, we're seeing biblical theology, big time. Coming down here now, not only are we a treasured possession, and also, so then also just another, so, but th if this is in a covenantal context, we'll talk about the covenantal context in, in, in the next video. But if this is a covenantal context, then this is, then our redemption and salvation is covenantal. And people don't want to talk about that. This is where it comes back to, it's never talked about in churches in, in our, in our first video, but here fundamental to our redemption is the, the benefit, one of the benefits that we receive as being in Christ is being this special treasured possession of, of, of God. So in, in Titus 2.14, covenant is not mentioned, but it is by way of this, the, the promise aspect. So we're looking for the concept, not necessarily the word. I hope everyone sees that. It is so strong. You cannot miss it. I don't see how reading these two, and if you read these two fairly in, in canonical context and histor in redemptive historical context, and if you hold to the in inerrancy and in inspiration of the word of God, I don't see how you don't make this connection. I, I just think it's beyond possibility. You have to make the connection. The next promise, so we have one promise here. And then really, this is being further unpacked into these two. So if you want to see three, that's fine. As long as we don't see radical discontinuity, we just see expansion and clarification. So the next thing we have here is a, a kingdom of priests. So let's just look, let's look up kingdom of priests. Let's see where we see this here. So uh, we see have New Testament references here. Let's see if we see, if we have this anywhere else in the, in the Old Testament. So let's look this up in, search this in Hebrew. Okay, so kingdom of priests does not occur again in in, in the Hebrew context, okay? So this is the one lone instance in the Hebrew context. So, so then that, that's significant. The next thing I want us to see here is that not every OT Israelite was a priest. Major point. Not every OT Israelite was a priest. 
And so what we can say here is this is already anticipating and pointing towards the new covenant in which in the new covenant, they will be a kingdom of priests. Okay, so already in, in the old covenant promise, fundamental in the old covenant promise is the fulfillment of a kingdom of priests where the entire nation, where the entire people of God are going to be priests. And so we want to ask the question, where is this fulfilled? And so we have actually a cross-reference here. So we can search cross-reference here, Exodus 19.6. We have several cross-references. So the first cross-reference occurs in, in 2 Peter 2.5. Let's blow this up here and let's just see what it says. As you come to him in 2.4 and following, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by the sight, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. So they're living stones built up as a spiritual house. So this is a priesthood, a spiritual house, a temple, paraphrase, temple, to be a, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So we have here the fulfillment of being a kingdom of priests is in 1 Peter 2, 4 and following. But notice this, the fundamentally that the, the priests offer spiritual sacrifices. So when we recognize this, we can search another place. So before we go to the other parallel passage, let's go to Romans 12. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So I would say that this, the, the substance of what it means to be a priestly nation, a priestly kingdom, is in this statement here. And so we could also include Romans 12, 1 and 2 in this description of being a royal priesthood. Okay, the next reference we have is Revelation 2, 5. So let's write this down here. So we can also, the fulfillment number one is in Peter 2, 4 and following. And then we can also see the fulfillment in Romans 12, 1 and following. Okay, that's really strong. Then we have the third one in Revelation 1, 5 to 6. So looking at Revelation 1, 5 to 6, to him who loves us, this is the church. This is, this, this is, so just to be clear here, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, the us would include John and the churches and the seven churches would, would the, the seven is symbolic of the perfect number. So this is John to the church, to the contemporary church in the first century. So to him, to Jesus Christ, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to our God. There's no way. So just to be clear here, this fulfillment is now in Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And this is the strongest, most explicit reference, literally kingdom and priests. Okay. So people will say this is just an application. I don't see how you can say that. It's just, let's come back and look at this one more time here. I just don't see how you can see this. To him who loves us and freed us and made us kingdom and priest to God. So, so are you going to say that there's two kingdoms, a kingdom of the church, a kingdom of Israel? Or do we see the church as the eschatological fulfillment of the promises to Israel co composed of both Israel, of Jew and Gentile? who are worshiping God in the body of Christ, the wall of hostility has been broken down. And it, well, as soon as we start talking about the wall of hostility being broken down and, and, and two being brought into one, we have to go to Ephesians 2, verse 18. The members of the household of God, fellow citizens and saints, members of the household of God, coming up here. At one time, you were separated from Christ, alienated, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. So this is really, this also, this too is a parallel. When we're looking at concepts. This too is a parallel context that we have to consider here. So number four, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. 
Okay, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. We are uh, um, coming down here. We are one. We are one body. We are the household of God, a holy structure joined together. It grows into a holy temple. So this is the, the priestly aspect, the dwelling place of God by his spirit. So coming back to here, you have, so you have a uh, kingdom, priests, sacrifices, and we also have temple. These are all in relationship to old, new covenant. This is the fulfillment. I just, I don't see how, I mean, this is just not one lone passage. This is a theme in the New Testament. It's so strong. Let's go to one more passage. Now, granted, there's a huge amount of debate with the millennial kingdom. Fair enough. Our point is not to discuss where the millennial kingdom is, when the millennial kingdom is. That's beyond the scope of our discussion. What I'm trying to prove to us is that the fulfillment is now in the church by way that we are priests and kingdom. And it's kind of crazy because the fundamental component of a Baptist, you have the acronym for Baptist. I won't repeat the whole acronym, but one of the fundamental aspects of of Baptist of Baptist like core fundamentals is the priesthood of the believers, which is wild. Like that's literally kingdom of priests promised in the in the Mosaic covenant, and so it's just it's there. So we come down here to the praise worship service in Revelation five. Worthy are you to take the scrolls to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom of a kingdom and priest our God. They shall reign. Now there's a debate here. It's beyond the scope of this class, but I want to say here, epi, it can be translated on or over. And so the reigning, the ruling is on the earth but doesn't require there to be a physical presence. They shall reign over the earth, I think is really a um, a, a caveat um, understanding that they are reigning over the earth. And if depending on how you see the millennial kingdom, it's just beyond the scope. But I want to I want to add that caveat. But the big the big point that we're highlighting here is you have made them a kingdom of priests. And again, the cross reference here is is chapter one, six. And then also it goes back to to Exodus 19, 6. So are we to to see that? You ransom a people for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom priest to our God. So this is a special group out of, special group out of every tribe, language, people, nation. So look here, coming back here, you have a a special group. You shall be my treasure possession among all the peoples. So again, do we see radical discontinuity and claim that Israel is a special group, the church is a special group, or do we have to see fulfillment? And I just, again, exegetically, historic, redemptive, uh, redemptive historically, I don't see how, I don't see how you can't acknowledge this. I mean, it's so strong. And so here we have, this is a, a restatement, Revelation 5, 10. And so now this is this is merging, merging treasured possession from nations, and this is kingdom, priests, rule. All right. So I say all this to say the fulfillment of this has to be. In the church, Jew and Gentile, by faith in the Messiah. And so we're look, we just looked forward. Now let's look back. Let's look back at the holy nation. What does the holy nation pick up on? So let's. And so what I want to say is this this nation, go, holy, uh, holy nation. So this is Vago Kadosh. This finds its origin in Genesis 12, 1. And I will make of you a great nation. Lego Gadol. Lego, Lego Gadol. And so this really is, this, this in, in, in the past, 
this is picking up on Abrahamic promise, on the Abrahamic promise. So we have Genesis 12, 2. And we talked about nation. This is a synonym for kingdom. You can watch our, our, our video on this on Cloud Seminary Plus. These two are synonymous. So what we want to say here is that coming back up to here, these two are really expanding upon and explaining each one. So Israel is a holy nation, specifically a kingdom of priests, if they are faithful. Of course, we see that Israel fails to do this because they did not pursue it by faith. And Christ fulfills this. Christ fulfills and earns and gives to his body, the church. So then let's look at the historic redemptive idea here, okay? And we'll come back, we'll really come back and unpack this more in a separate video. But let me just let me just sketch this since we already have this up here. So what we have here is so in Genesis 12, 2. So this is a time. This is time. We have the, the great nation promise. Okay. And this is this is also we talked about how this implies kingdom. And this is the this is during the Abrahamic covenant. And then if we if we if we track along the trajectory, we can go to Genesis 17 and he is going to be a, a father of a multitude of nations. And looking here, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings will come from you. And so then we have here in Genesis 17, a reference to nations and kings. Okay. So this is what this is. This is pointing to. And moving on. Okay. Then we have Exodus 19, 5. And this is kingdom, nation, holy, and also priests. So, and this is the this is the old covenant. So this is really building upon and partially fulfilling. So this is a partial fulfillment, but also pointing beyond. Then coming along to Davidic, the, the Davidic covenant, which we're looking at next week. Coming down here, we see that coming down to verse 16, we have then 2 Samuel 7, verse 15, sorry, 16. We have your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. So now we have the promise of the Davidic kingdom, right? So again, this is also a partial fulfillment and promise. Partial fulfillment. Promise. Okay. And then we have coming along here, Luke 22, 28. We have the, and this is wild. So then here coming up here to verse 20, you have the inauguration of the, the new covenant. This is the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. So this is a reference to the inauguration of the new covenant. Right? So it's it's happening and it's in the church, and we celebrate in the church every month. We celebrate the, the Passover and and the and the and the cup of the table, the Lord's the Lord's Supper. And then coming down here to verse 28, you you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, as I covenant to you, as I covenant to you, as my father covenanted with me, a kingdom. So then here, looking here at the at looking at the at Luke. 22, 20 to 30, this is the inauguration 
of new covenant, right? The promise is the a kingdom. You've got to be kidding me. This is in the church. Okay? And so I'm saying all this to say we're, we're in the new covenant. So as, as far as covenants go, mo, the Mosaic covenant as a system, we are no longer under. But those eternal aspects of the Mosaic covenant, of the old covenant, as the light shone and they were revealed because of the presence of the substance, the covenant of grace, those are still in effect and those are still binding. And fundamentally, the substance is still present. So that we'll see in the rest of the semester, Paul will literally say, if you love other, if, if you don't covet, if you don't murder, you don't commit adultery, you are fulfilling the law. So the law is still in effect. The substance, not the contextual aspects, not the, the, not the shadowy types, but the substance, the weightier matters of the law are still in effect. And, and we see here by way of kingdom, the fulfillment. So now we're seeing fulfillment here. Okay, and so I say all this to say, I hope that this is making sense as we unpack this. So if I was preaching this, I would really bring out, you can't, you can't preach and explain this without looking at the New Testament fulfillment. You, it's inappropriate. I'd say it's exegetically inappropriate. And so some of you are not traditional covenanters. I think that, you know, dispensationalists will talk about just by way of ap application I I don't I, I I'm struggling to to see that it's not by application it's it's partial fulfillment now so if you still want to have a dispensational system in some way fine I would I would reject the, the the two peoples of God I would reject two plans of salvation I would reject just an app, application aspect I would say there's a partial fulfillment now in the church it's already inaugurated we are part of the new covenant. If you are in Christ, you are receiving the benefits of the shedding of his blood in the blood in the new covenant. So, so I, I would really push you to be a lot closer to continuity than discontinuity. And, and I'm pushing you because that's what the scripture, I believe, is, is teaching. If our exegesis is sound, and, and, I, and I think that it's really sound here. The last thing I want to highlight here is, um, and we're running out of time for this video, is just to bring out two things. Concerning Moses, Moses is Moses is the is is mediator. So Moses is mediating here, and so I would want to bring out here the Christ. Christ is the one who mediates the new covenant, the covenant of grace. So again, this is where you have to look at Christ and consider Christ and the sons of Israel. This is really bringing out Jacob. And ultimately, Abraham. So the Abrahamic covenant is in view, the promise of Abraham. And of course, we talked about law. The law is the law is present here, here, and here. And so if you preach this or teach this, we should be talking about the law. Here now, our confession and the law. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws hang all the prophets, the entire Old Testament, and that's still binding for us today. So I just want to then, I want to briefly proclaim Christ. And so what I, I want to pro pro proclaim the gospel to us in this, in this study. And the next video that we'll be discussing is we'll look at more of the covenant. We kind of looked at the covenant presently, but we'll really highlight all the different covenantal aspects. We'll, we'll go into to some more discussions on the covenant. And then we'll also discuss exegetical and the big idea. Um, the exegetical big idea, but we also have to include, we also have to include uh our considerations for 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 the the redemptive historical aspect but here here now this proclamation so th these truths point us to Israel's failure to keep the covenant the covenant was was put out to Israel for them to keep and to do and fundamentally they should have approached it by faith 
resting and trusting in the faithful Israelite, the, the promised seed who would come and undo the curse of sin and death, fulfill all of the law. And we have assurance in Christ, the faithful son, the faithful son of Abraham, the faithful son of David, the faithful son of Jacob and Isaac, the faithful son of Adam. He is the faithful son who redeemed us through his sacrifice, his work, and made us a kingdom, priest to our God. And we, and we will reign with him forever by faith. And so uh, we will catch you on the next video. Just by, briefly, the, 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 the next video, we'll be looking at the, all the different covenants, just focusing on the covenant aspect. And then we'll also have a short video on the exegetical outline, preparing the exegetical outline, and also a big idea from, from an exegetical perspective. You would still have to, to, to tweak it to bring in the homiletics. But uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to interpret it to set you up to, to really understand how important this is. And just by way of conclusion, this passage is fundamental for understanding covenants, biblical theology. This is fundamental for understanding the old covenant. If you don't understand this, the old covenant doesn't make a lot of sense. It also looks at relationships between old and new covenants, the other covenants, Davidic covenant, Abrahamic covenant. And, and then also we can use this for looking at the law and also for theology of Exodus. So we will catch you on the next video looking further at covenants, the covenant relationship. And also we will, we will have one more video that really helps lay out the exegetical outline and big idea. And our prayer and desire is that you take all this content, you would study it, you would rest in it, you would teach it in a small group, in a devotional, or also you could, you could preach it or you could teach it in a Sunday school. And so God bless you and we'll catch you on the next video.